Dear friends, it is the season of weddings. I went on Google and I did a search, the most common month for weddings, and what came up is that June is the most common month to get hitched. And weddings are a big industry. There's a whole industry around the food and everything design-wise. And one of the most common trends in, in, in marriage right now is to create your own vows. You want to creatively think how you're going to vow and profess your love to one another. Well, to get our minds going in this kind of uh, wedding uh, theme, I have some hypothetical vows for you here. I want to see if you, you think these are good or bad vows. And, and we're going to start with the groom first. Okay, so I've created some vows for you. Here's the groom. Groom says, sweetheart, I promise to love you. I promise to be there for you in all circumstances, to listen and to help I promise to put your needs before my own. I promise to provide for you. I promise to be faithful to you, to serve you, and if I have to, give my life for you. For this is how much I love you. You mean the world to me. Groom's, how do you do? That's all right. All right, now, now let's listen to the bride's response. See what you think of these. Right. Dear, I promise to love you on my terms. I want you to be 100% faithful to me. But I would like to play the field if I find someone more clever or handsome or if I just get bored with you. I want you to be there for me and listen to me at all times and in all circumstances. And I will be there for you if there is enough time left in my schedule to allow. Also, I would prefer not to take this relationship public. I do not want my coworkers or others to know we are married. Around our family, it will be okay to spill the beans, but we better not talk about it too much there either. And so with that, take it. I'm yours. <laughs> oh, right. I was thinking if that was the way things went down, my crew might be a little bit hesitant, and, and so should be. I'm not, I'm not sure the probability of things working out so well in that type of relationship. But I bring this up because if we're on the Ten Commandments, and God says, you know what, you should have no other gods. And it's not just a blanket statement as if he has done nothing for us. Remember those vows? Who is he? He's the groom, right? He said, I have cared for you. I have loved you. In fact, everything that was promised, I've already done for you. In fact, giving my life to save you. And in response, the right response. And I believe we struggle in, in following the Lord to the degree that He's followed us, and that's because of our sinful nature. But I believe, fueled by grace, and fueled by what Jesus has done, and knowing that salvation is already accomplished, we can do so much better than what that right said. Let's talk about that. And let's get into our lesson this morning from Exodus chapter 20. I invite you to turn now to the Word of God as we read from Exodus chapter 20, 36. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And that seems like a bad connotation, but what he really means is like he's an exclusive God. He demands exclusivity. It's not like he's needy. Alright? That's not our God. He's not needy. I'm a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who came to me, but showing love to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. A bit on that explanation. Have you ever noticed that in Christianity it takes a generation to kind of swing the tide? I can look back and it was three generations above me that brought Christ to the Bloomer household and it's transcendent. So also that happens with our faith life. That also indicates that happens with unbelief as well. That as you turn from the Lord, that also has a generational effect. This is the word of God. But it makes it clear, right? No other gods besides me. In view of what I have done, Let's talk about that next Let's get into it. What I find very interesting about this portion of Scripture is what's happening when, Jesus, when, when God says you shall have no other gods. Right? And it's very interesting if you know the Old Testament, right? 
Because here, I have some pictures for you. We, we know Moses is Charlton Heston, right? Um, that, that, that's who Moses was. And then he's on the mountain, Mount Sinai. Right? And there's a big cloud around the mountain. You can't miss this. And below, when God is saying, you shall have no other gods, down in the camp, you know what they're doing? They are at the present time making another god. They're taking all the plunder of Egypt, the gold, and they're melting it down to make a golden calf. And it's kind of like if you're in a household where mom yells around the room, I made cookies, but no cookies before dinner. And the child at that moment, when he hears it, has his hand in the cookie jar. Right? And what I see from the context of the story is just how natural it is for us to want to have other idols and have things that come before the one true God. It is very, very natural. But some of you look at this picture and you're thinking some pious thoughts. You're thinking, Pastor, you know, I can let you into my house and you will find there are no golden calves there. In fact, I have other statues from, from earthly resemblance of, of earth or, or heaven or waters. In fact, I don't bother out any statues, Pastor. I'm good to go. And while that might be the case, I believe we all struggle with this idea of idolatry putting something, whatever that thing is, before our God. I want to try to unearth this morning what might be tempting you this morning. I have a test that we're going to go through, a test that will help you identify what might be a false God or an idol in your life. Are you ready for it? Ready to continue? The test is composed of two questions. And the questions are here. The first question for identifying your idol is this. Your response is, what has the potential to make you uncontrollably angry, anxious, or despondent if you lost it? All right, think of your life now. If it was taken away, if it was no longer in your life, if you lost it, what has the potential to make you incredibly angry, anxious, or despondent? Ready for the next one? Next one. On what or whom do you spend most of your free time? It could be free time or regular time, it doesn't really matter. What do you spend most of your time and money on? Look at your life, look at the checkbook, look at the bank statement, look at the time, hours spent. What do you spend most of your time and money on? Dear friends, I believe those answers could be the same thing. They don't have to. But I also believe whatever you answer, whatever conjured up in your mind, might tempt you. And you might be wrestling with putting it before our God. And the interesting thing about idolatry is that your answers might not necessarily be bad. Like I look at the golden calf and I'm like, those idiots, you know, who worships the golden calf? Or I look at the different gods of the Old Testament, Baal and Asherah, and I'm like, yeah, they're heathen gods, they're bad, they want, you know, awful sacrifices and practices. But what you may have identified is that your responses are actually good. You might have come up with, well, my kids, a spouse, my career, which aren't inherently evil or bad. But here's the thing, even though they're not inherently bad or evil, they can become God. In fact, another had this quote to say about idolatry said this. Um, said it's idolatry is taking an incomplete joy of this world, and that's what anything other than God is. It's an incomplete joy. It's a joy, but it can't fulfill everything. It's an incomplete joy in building your entire life on. And you see what happens when you make a good thing a God thing, you set yourself up for dis disappointment. When you make a good thing a God, then you set yourself up for failure and to feel disenfranchised and to feel just betrayed. Because if something is coming before God today, that idol, whatever it is, you will reach a point where you will look at that idol and say, You lied to me. You promised that you would fulfill my deepest desires and fulfill my, my greatest needs and have my dreams come true. You lied to me. I spent my money. I spent my time on you. You didn't come through for me. Liar! Why? Because they're incomplete. They're 
We were never meant to fulfill all that our God But the good news is, the reason we start a church and are excited about the mission of our church is that we have the God who has said, you can come to me and I will give you life and you will have life to the full. That in me all your deepest needs and desires are met. That I know how to keep my promises. That you will never feel betrayed because everything I have promised will come true in your life. This is the God that we worship and praise. This is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the God of Israel who spoke this word today. This is the God who on our behalf sent His Son to die on the cross to shed His blood and wipe our hearts of idolatry so that we could be clean in His forever. This is God. And really when you look at Him compared to anything else, He makes everything else look silly. What is a golden calf compared to the Almighty God, the maker of heaven and earth, the Savior? And I believe God does want to meet all our needs. Wants to be there for us in every and any circumstance. In fact, to talk about this, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what might be your favorite department store. What's for ours for a bit? I want to talk about Target. Any Target fans? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Love Target. And if you follow Target as I have, you've seen that they've expanded in recent years, haven't they? In fact, I remember just maybe a year ago in Lennox, they had the grocery department added, right? Also, I can go to the electronics section and I see they sell Apple products and basically everything I need that might need for electronics. And it seems like they're trying to communicate to me, you know, you don't need to go to the grocery store. We got that covered. You don't need to go to Best Buy. Got that cover too. In fact, you don't need to go anywhere else. We're going to be the one-stop shop. We're going to cover it all. That's Target. I believe our God says the same thing to his people in the Old Testament to us today. See, let me explain something about Old Testament religion. Back then, you had many different gods for many different areas of life. And so you had a God if you wanted good crops. You had a God of the sun. You had a God of the rain. You had God if you wanted wisdom. You had God if you wanted a romantic relationship. You had God for every portion of life. And so the one true God says, you don't need them. I got them all covered. I'll, I'll do whatever those other ones claim to do with it while you're searching them. And you and I, God says the same thing. He says, you're chasing after pleasures. You're chasing after money. You're chasing after the right things for your children. You're chasing after the right things for your career. You're chasing after all these things that, 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 that void of me is going to happen. But I'm saying if you bring all those concerns to me, you let me be your umbrella policy for life, I will cover all of the that you could ever imagine, and you will find satisfaction as I meet those needs. And I know this because this is what Jesus promised. Jesus told us this, right? We even have a kid song that we might know from heart. Seek ye first. God said, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things that you run after and chase after and are maybe too entangled this morning with, he's going to satisfy. And he's going to work out. And so we stand as that groom, those perfect vows, saying, I, I will serve you, and I will push you first, and I have already done this, and I will continue to do so. But now maybe let's discuss how we can respond to such a, to such a commitment from our God. How we can respond as the bride of the church to that faithful to Talk about this, I want to talk a little bit about basketball. Have you watched the NBA Finals coming up? Looks like it's going to be Miami and OKC. I wish it was the Bulls. They were close back in the I watch SportsCenter, and sometimes they're getting the impression that players think the team or the organization is just there for their purposes. What I mean is this, that the players, by the way they're talking, think that the, the Miami Heat or, or, or OKC just exists so that they might get personal accolades. 
You know, I'm a part of this team so I can get what I want, so I can get my ring, so I can get paid, so I can get MVP and trophy. It's about me. And they look at the organization as the means to their own personal end. Right? I get that impression. It doesn't have to be NBA, it could be any sport. Whereas, how does the organization view the player? It's the role first, right? The organization looks at the player and says, no, no, no. You're the means to our end. See, it's about creating good organizations, it's about winning champions here, it's about hanging in the rafters of those banners that say we are champions. See, you're going to be the means to, to our end. I bring this up because you know as Christians we have that same temptation to be like the players in the NBA. To look at God and to look at the church and say, God, so glad you're here to serve my purposes. I use you for my personal gain and my personal blessing. And so I can get ahead. And I'm so glad you're gonna you're gonna do everything for me and, and my will. And don't get me wrong, that's partly true. And it is true that God loves you to the point of death, and that He knows your name, and that He wants things to work out. Well, that's true. But while it's partly true, I don't think it's primarily true. See, I believe in the church, and when it comes to our God, He wants to use us for His purposes, not vice versa. That we are means to His end in the Great Commission. That it's about giving Him glory. It's about accomplishing His mission. It's about doing the things that He would want in our lives. And we are so simple. And I'll, I'll claim that I'm, I'm, I'm most of all simple. We are so simple that you know what the ridiculous notion is that creeps into our hearts when we hear that God wants to use us to give Him glory? It's a ridiculous response. I feel bad for even saying it. But the ridiculous response is this. It sure seems like a selfish God. Me for your glory. I mean, who do you think you are? And the answer, and this is why it's ridiculous, he's God! <laughs> you know the one who gave you life and breath and everything else? The creator of heavens and earth? He's God! Who else is worthy of glory? Is your investment maker worthy of more glory? Is your boss at work? Is your kids? Really? Who's going to take the place? And God says, every knee will bow to me someday, and every tongue will confess that I am God, whether willingly or unwillingly, who else is going to get it? This is the God we serve. And I believe he is worthy of all glory, all praise, and honor, and humility before him. If we would just but humble our hearts, Stop thinking just what's in it for me and see that he has greater purposes involved. And that's our opportunity. To live in light of his love. To know we've already been saved and loved by him. To know that it is true that he has served us and loved us and saved us. But to also know it's not just about me and it's not just about me. That he has greater purposes. And so, dear friends, I hope that you will trust to have all your emotions pent up in who God is. And to have all your dreams pent up, not in what is your will, but what is his will. Because that's setting yourselves up for success. He will not disappoint. And if you want an indication if you're getting it, if you're on the right track, I have one final quote for you this morning. I think an indication that you're getting there and you're on the right track, though we're not ever perfect, is this. We think we've learned about grace, set our idols aside, and reached a place where we're serving God, not for what we're going to get from Him. He's not the means to our end, but just for who He is. Because you have a great God. Amen.